Well, my name is Mike McKenzie. I'm the program manager here at the Community Voting Center. The Voting Center is a 501c3 charitable nonprofit organization. It was founded in 2006 by a couple community members, a group of community members that then became the board of directors. Um, and they perceived a need for small boat safety education and also access to Bellingham Bay um, at an affordable rate. So they uh, they approached a business that was here located at, at this site called Fairhaven Boat Works and, uh, and worked out an arrangement where Fairhaven Boat Works would actually close and the, the nonprofit would be formed and um, buy out the assets of the organization and then the Boating Center opened its doors in 2007 for the first classes and rentals uh, and also dry moorage of small boats. So the Boating Center's mission is really to provide boating safety education um, and this happens both actively in classes and programs that are offered but also passively um, through rentals. You know, if someone walks through the gates and they say, I'd love to run a kayak or my family's visiting or I've taken one of your sailing classes and I'd like to go out and sail a keel boat. And there's going to be a conversation at the front desk or on the front porch that's like, okay, what's your experience? What's your interest? What's your party look like? What's the weather forecast look like for the day? Where would you like to paddle? Where do we strongly suggest or, or um, disallow you to, to go depending on conditions? So there's education both formally in classes but also just anyone who comes down here and wants to engage with the boating center. So um, my title is program manager, so I try to make all the, the programmatic offerings of the boating center happen, whether it's adult sailing classes or adult sea kayaking classes, or youth camps, which are happening outside right now, um, in both sailing and paddle sports. Occasionally we'll offer, um, the spread can change annually depending on community interest, depending on our capacity. So we'll do some sliding seat sculling classes. We've done paddle boarding classes in the past. Um, we offer other community programs such as free boating opportunities or uh, this season we're doing some ferry farewell flotillas to send off the Alaskan ferry, which is really an opportunity for boat and small boat enthusiasts of all kinds to bring their boats and get a rental discount from the boating center and just galvanize around a central theme. So uh, programs like that are also seasonally offered by the boating center, but it really comes back to the mission of small boat safety education. How can we um, enable primarily novices or new boaters to have fun, the whole point of outdoor recreation and being active, but um, to do it safely so you can come back, um, I like to say, with a, a trauma-free experience so that you have fun um, and you learn how to keep yourself fun and safe in the future. So that's, that's really the core of all the programs we offer regardless of what the modality is um, and, and how it changes over the years. Um, the Boating Center has also grown to offer dry moorage as a way for um, community members to store small boats under 26 feet whether it's human or sail powered down here at the waterfront. So if you live in an apartment and you just you simply don't have the space for a boat or maybe you don't want to drive and, and trans transport your boat that way. You can bike down or bus down or walk down or drive down um, and take your kayak out or take a small sailboat out of your of your own. Um, and that's a, one of the th primarily the three ways that the Boating Center uh, gets revenue as well through classes resin, classes and lessons, the programs, uh, boat rentals, so delivery, and then also dry mortgage. And then uh, direct giving, whether it's monetary giving or um, in kind, you know, someone donates a pile of life jackets that their grandkids screw out of, or um, volunteering their time. But all those three components of the way people give to the community voting center and to their fellow community members, that's a huge portion of the pie that sustains the, the, the voting center. Um, and volunteers are engaged from all levels, whether they're helping with delivery and helping kind of uh, be a docent to new people walking through the gate or a board member or coming down and re-roofing a building for a weekend, the more enjoyable back-breaking work. So um, volunteers are really the backbone of the boating center. Um, so that's how I would kind of describe how it operates. There's both the revenue streams of programs and rentals and dry mortgage and, and also direct engagement through giving of all sorts, um, sorts of ways. So yeah, it's kind of synopsis of the boating center's history and um, we're still a young organization. 2007 was not that long ago, so every year definitely represents a lot of change physically and programmatically and, um, in the leadership of the organization. So. Yeah.
classes. We sure do. We have a number of class options for adults, including sea kayaking and sailing. Um, or we have quite a few kids camp going on over the summer, sailing classes and sail and paddle sports classes. Oh, cool. How much are, are what are the ages to go out on the boat? Uh, well, for kids, it is between the ages of 9 and 14, and beyond that, they could take out or uh, join one of our adult sailing classes. So over 14, 15 and over is adult classes? Generally, we do uh, make a couple of exceptions, um, especially if there's going to be a number of older kids in a, in a kids camp, we might you know, allow a 15 year old to come down and sail with uh, the youth camp, but um, you know, it's really up to, to the kid and the parent whether or not they want to be in an adult class or in a youth camp. Oh, okay. And that's what's coming in right now? Yep, we have a couple of sailors on two different keel boats. They're rolling up their sails right now. They sailed out to Chuckanut Island today, and we'll have to go pick them up in our safety boat here pretty soon. Um, do you have to have any certification for the kayaks? Uh, well, you do not have to have any prior any prior experience. If you want to take out a sit on top kayak, we let anybody take those out. Um, if you want to take out a sea kayak, though, we like to see that you are familiar with the sea kayak and that you have some experience um, and know how to deal with a capsize if that were to happen. And so if you can perform something that we call a wet exit um, and demonstrate that to us, then we'll let you take out a sea kayak. Do you help people just do the, learn how to do the rollover or is that something mm -hmm. you have to take longer lessons for? Um, well, that would be something that we would want to schedule with our kayaking instructor. We would recommend if somebody had no experience and they wanted to get into a sea kayak we could schedule a private lesson or they could sign up for one of our kayaking classes with any number of our half a dozen kayaking instructors that we have employed here okay and what about the sailboats um well the sailboats if you have experience sailing and you haven't taken any of our classes we uh, recommend scheduling a sailing checkout. It's $20. It takes between 45 minutes and an hour and we just go out on the water in one of our boats with our sailing instructor, sail around the bay a little bit and make sure that you're all good to go to sail on your own. If you don't have any experience, once again I recommend signing up for one of our classes or taking a private lesson. I thank you very much.
Here at the boating center and we're talking with the captain mike Hi. and you're a volunteer uh, here and you take the plume out correct during yeah. the it's the only time you take the plume out is when the ferry leaves yeah um sometimes we'll do some pro, um, home port learning center associated events if somebody won a um an auction i'll take them out and um, take them for a, a row sale situation but yeah we we go out uh, we're going out four times at the community boating center this summer okay and the dates are online correct yeah on the boating center yeah. are they on homeport's website as well they are not i could put those in yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay um when you take the plume out uh -huh. this is a replica of a of what kind of boat that captain Cook used to have. Actually, yes, Captain Cook. Um, Plume is a replica of a ship's boat from the Discovery, which was captained by Captain Vancouver, who um, named a lot of the, the things around here. But they did most of the charting in this area from boats just like the Plume. The Plume is as close as they could to the, the cutter from the Discovery. There'd be one boat that was bigger than Plume and then they had two that were smaller but they'd send those boats out ahead of the big ship in these literally uncharted waters so they can chart them they didn't want to be tearing the hull out of their home away from home when they're 20,000 miles from England and um, if these boats bump into a rock it's easy enough to haul them back on the ship and repair them but they'd sent these out and nearly all the charts were made from the inside from the um, from those boats they did all the exploring from the boats from these little ones mm -hmm. and this this is a wooden boat like what they have there uh -huh. <laughs> hi Camille hey Camille can you sit back you can watch from here if you want you need to be quiet okay thank you <laughs> Possessive. Um, yeah, it's um, plume is used um, was built like the um, just like the boats would have been made. We used some more modern fasteners, and some of the glues and the finishes are a little different. But um, the lines are just what they had at the, the um, at the British Admiralty. Um, we get the fellow that drew the plans got the original plans right from the British Admiralty in London. Oh and then redrew them so it's easier for us to understand and we built her in 1995. And you yeah. had a couple of people that were very knowledgeable about ships? Correct. Um, there's a ge gentleman named uh, Mason Hinn who l led the building of Plume and um, he was um, a very instrumental um, shipwright in the building of the Lady Washington, our oh, okay. state flagship and was in the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, Lady Washington was in the Pirates of the Caribbean and um, Mason Hinn was instrumental in building that. He did the lofting, so he led us through building Plume and um, she's turned out wonderful. Here she is just about nine or 20 years old and doing very fine. And the students at Homeport helped build her, but then um, the big thing and under my watch was taking care of her for all these years. So we haul her out and maintain, paint, scrape off the chips and make sure that the hull's safe and strong and there's no rot. And, and then the um, plume is also a great place, floating classroom, kids to learn teamwork and following orders, hands-on history. Um, they, they get a chance to see Bellingham from a perspective that I think very few um, young people in Bellingham get to, to see Bellingham from the bay. It's uh, nothing like getting taken out of your element. Right. 
and also to see the um, the turns, the um, the cormorants, the harbor seals up close and personal. I think it's very, very fascinating and interesting for the my students. Do they get to practice charting the bay? We've done charting. We use the um, same thing that they use on the Discovery. We have a lead line, which is basically just a pendulum tied um, on a long string, and you throw it in, and you wait till it hits the bottom, and you just find out how many how deep it is and you count that off and so we have done practice charting just like they did in um, 1792. Wow. How did, how did you come up with the, some, who came up with the idea to actually um, recreate a boat? There were, um, there was a group and I, I would say it was led by a fellow named Greg Foster. Um, and he was in um, Galliano Island, Whaler Bay and he led the, the bicentennial of the exploration of these waters. <clears throat> he, um, and he was the shipwright that redrew the plans so we could build them. Um, there were, I think, nearly a dozen longboats built to commemorate that, oh. that bicentennial in 1992. Um, originally, Bellingham was hoping to build it here for the for the bicentennial and they weren't able to get that taken care of. In fact, that route's definitely come back to the Community Boating Center and its predecessor organization run by Tip Johnson. Tip was part of the committee that tried to have that boat, which turned out to be, and eventually was Plume, built for the bicentennial. Oh. And um, so the roots are definitely right where we're sitting, exactly where we're sitting. The, the discussion that this boat should be built for Bellingham and um, when it was the, the Discovery's cutter came in and did some charting of the area in Bellingham Bay, um, it was the boat just like Plume. So that's, it's very, in, very much in its place. It's a replica of the ship's boat that came to Bellingham Bay, the first vi vis visit from an English craft. Wow, yeah. that's pretty impressive. It now, it, so it wasn't built here in Bellingham, it was built? The, um, the, the plume or the, um, the, plume. the plume was built in at Homeport Learning Center. Oh, it was built there. Yeah, okay. we built it um, right here in, um, in our shop on 707 Astor Street. Oh, yeah. wow. okay. So it was, that was built here. Correct. Okay. Yeah. But it, was it part of the centennial, bicentennial then? Um, it, it missed it by two years. <laughs> yeah. Actually, we, yeah, we, we launched it in, um, in 96, not, um, or um, maybe four years trying to getting my my dates messed up but yeah it was actually we launched in 96 so it's um 19 years old yeah. <laughs> time for editing <laughs> anyway yeah 19 years old and missed it by the, the bicentennial by a couple of years yeah okay. yeah that's that's very impressive though that i mean that that purpose came up and that absolutely completed it right even if it was late for the bicentennial it's still a very interesting historical boat um, one of the wonderful things about boats like Plume are they are so practical to get people on the water and get them involved in hands-on history. If you put them on a ship like Lady Washington, they are very much bystanders even if they're standing on deck. Yeah, you can get them to pull on lines and you can get them to sing shanties and do some <laughs> some work perhaps in tacking the ship but there's not a lot to do it's very mostly it has to be done by the professional sailors where plume we can get people right off the beach and put an oar in their hand and they become part of the crew we don't have passengers on the plume everybody on the plume is a member of the crew and they have to contribute and even if somebody has something going wrong we put them to work on um, boat watch bow watch or looking for traffic or I'll put the tiller I have, I'll have them steer so I really try to get involvement and um, the cost of them is n nowhere near um, very in very insane amount of money it takes to keep the Lady Washington float um, insurance and maintenance it's very very difficult to run a program on there where plume is very um, very low budget comparatively and um, and you get you can have as many people active much more active on plume than you would 
with um, something like the Lady Washington Tall Ship. It's, um, how many passengers can you take, or how many crew people can you take on this ship? We we can take um, we can have ten oar stations and then um, a person steering and a bow watch, so we can easily have twelve people and then a captain. Um, I I like um, s slightly smaller numbers. I like to make sure everybody's very active, but. We can run it with um, as little as four people. We did that last uh, Friday night when we sent the ferry off. We just had four guests on board, four new crew members. <laughs> yep. Do you think anything else that you're interested in? Uh, ask him if there's anything else he, he would like to say. Um, do, should, should I say anything about the f upcoming um, events? Or is it sure. gonna be, this gonna air too late? Might air too late. Um, okay. You can maybe generically. Um, okay. The um, if anybody's ever interested in Plume, they can contact um, Homeport Learning Center at homeportlc at gmail .com or give um, the Community Boating Center a shout and ask um, any programs we're doing. Um, I'd love to. I, um, I would love to talk to anybody about the history of the boat or the, the mission of the school. Homeport is um, it's in its 22nd year starting this year. And Almost as old as the boat. I yeah. Mean, the boat's older than uh, no, actually we're, yeah. we're a little older. Yeah, we, we started older. when we were a year and a half old. Yeah. And, um, and we knew it was going to be part of the program and it is our floating classroom. Oh, okay. Sure. But, um, Homeport deals with adjudicated and at-risk youth, and it's been very, very successful at getting kids to buy in to following and being part of a team, um, team and um, following orders, and it's not just a power trip. <laughs> um, it it's also teaches leadership because some of the students get to um, give commands and steer the ship and or be um, stroke oars and lead the pace of the, the rowing. And um, you cannot do that until you've earned that. And just like in any job, it's a great way for them to learn how to lead and be responsible. Yeah, Homeport sounds like a really unique school that's valuable for helping kids that are being following school and sitting in a classroom all day. And all, it seems like that's too much for some kids. The vast majority of programs like Plume last five maybe ten years it's pretty amazing that we're here going into our 22nd year and largely it's um, the focus of the the staff to make sure it, it happened and it's, um, board members that are committed for us to go on and the school district support so it's all public monies that run the school so we um, the students are get the benefit of the school through all this community support, including the boating center. And um, it's an opportunity for the public to know what the school is doing um, through their trips on plume. They have to suffer my, um, <laughs> my, my discussions about how the school's benefiting the community.
one of the things when the, my students or even community members, when they get in the plume and they start pulling, when they feel they're pulling together, there is something that is so exciting and wonderful. When all the ores hit together, there is this synergy is greater than the sum of the parts of the energy that come together. And, and it feels really wonderful. It transcends the experience. I really like the idea of getting communities together and helping. And it's a metaphor for so much. Um, I love to see what's happened. That's happened here at the Community Boating Center. We, um, my wife was actually on the board for a little while and we saw more and more people climbing in and supporting this wonderful asset. And not only is it really fun, but I think the, the biggest benefit is this program is saving lives and will save lives. We are surrounded by waters. Everywhere we look around Bellingham, kids, adults, are getting in boats all the time. The more people we get educated through Community Boating Center's actions, the safer it's going to be. Do you, at Home Park, do you, um, is that a place that some homeless kids end up going to? Or? We have what, I, um, what I'm going to call couch surfers. We actually have a fair amount of kids at any time we probably have one to three kids that really have no stable place to live. They're re referred to us through social workers, probation officers, and school administrators. That's how we get our students. And, and sometimes just through word of mouth. Um, qu actually, uh, quite often, one student will say, you know, you should try home port to another. Teenagers downtown. Mm -hmm. I was right. wondering if they were ever steered toward your school. We are. Our budget is well below two hundred thousand dollars a year, which is crazy, considering we're, we're dealing with um, twenty-four kids that are at not only at risk of, of juvenile delinquency, but they some of them actually putting the community at risk through some of their behaviors. Um, the cost that they can do in a bad night is astronomical and not, not, not to mention over their lifetimes. If we can help them buy in and show them their skills and buy into the community, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you, there, there are statistics that put numbers on that, but we all know that, it's, that is profoundly valuable to try to help these kids find a, a better path than the one they're taking. Because yeah. there's a lot of paths and they're going to find something to do. And um, unfortunately, a lot of the schools have let hands-on activities go by the wayside. And, um, no more shop. Right. That's getting a little better, but um, I like to tell my students if if they want to see a real behavior problem, if they put me behind, tried to put me behind a desk for 30 hours a week, somebody would have to deal with a behavior problem in me. A lot of people just aren't made for doing pencil paper stuff all week long, day in, day out.
And uh, I've been telling my friends over the past couple of days about the experience because we we do a brief intro to the kayaks and kayak anatomy and what it's like to be out in the water at night. And then we hit the water in this group on Saturday. It was just really fast. They're most groups there's usually like an outlier either ahead or behind or but they were really well matched so all the boats were keeping a good pace so we made great time and we had um we went around the, um, the industrial area here and around post point and to the south and there's a lagoon just south of post point that when the tide is high enough you can slip in with kayaks and it's perfect to experience bioluminescence because it's protected and it's sheltered so the water is calmer and you can make out um, the bioluminescence better and that's also for an instructor it's kind of a pen you know all your students are in one place they're safe you can keep an eye on them but we went in the lagoon uh, with I think the youngest participants were maybe a couple years younger than me but most of them I'd say 50 or 50 plus is the average age and all we did was spend an hour splashing around and playing in the boats but you know all you have to do is agitate the water and the, uh, the type of plankton will you know emit light when it's, when it's irritated uh, so we just went in the lagoon and that was it I, you, all you could hear when we turned our deck lights off was just a bunch of adults splashing in the water playing in the water for an hour I mean, and then we passed out some fruit and chocolate and had a snack but there wasn't a lot there wasn't a lot of structure it's not a lot of uh, not like there's a rigorous class outline it, there's nothing more enjoyable than taking a bunch of adults out at night just to play you know that we need that in our lives regardless of what age we are so it was really a really enjoyable outing so is that one particular time of the year when it happens when the bioluminescence happens well the plankton that are resident in our waters that cause bioluminescence they're always they're always here in the salt water um year round but their populations change dramatically in the summertime with um i believe believe the the one species that is predominantly the cause is a, is a phytoplankton so it photosynthesizes so after the spring we get longer days and more intense sunlight and the po populations will change increase dramatically uh, but they also change it it can v be incredibly variable for one day the next depending on tidal cycle and how much freshwater rain we have and, um, other factors i'm sure i'm not aware of so usually by july like july to september is a pretty good sweet spot but um there's no there's no sure bet you know how intense it will be or how intense it won't be so uh, july is pretty good the getting gets good you know if you want to go down to teddy bear cove at night and go for a dip you probably see good bioluminescence in july yeah so uh what do you uh require people who want to check out their kayak like anybody can rent to sit on top yeah um the only boats that we restrict based on experience are not the only boats, but sea kayaks, uh, sailboats, and then rowing skulls, so rowing shells. Um, and for sea kayaks, we require that folks have the experience and the current ability to do a wet exit and a self-recovery. So the reasoning is that someone should not be experiencing that and figuring it out, you know, for the first time when um, when they're not expecting to be in the water. That's the, that really is not the time to practice. So. Um, we're, the goal is not to corner people into you know, taking a class from the boating center or a lesson. That would be great if folks choose to, but you can learn it from a friend. You can learn it from another school. As long as you have the skills to get back in your boat and continue on your way, you know, that could be the deal breaker between a great paddle and a traumatic experience. You know, if you, someone can't get back in their boat and they've never tried or had the opportunity to try. So um, those are the ability and experience of wet exiting and self-recovering for sea kayaks is really all that we, we require. Um, and that's why the sit on tops are a great option. When folks come in and they say, well, I don't have that experience and I don't have the time to learn or maybe the money to learn today, then we have an alternate option. We, you know, we don't have to say, well, I'm sorry, we can't get you out in the water, which isn't really acceptable for what we offer. So um, that's a, the sit on tops are a good alternate to the sea kayaks for that reason. And then for a sailing, uh, we do require an actual on-water checkout orientation, as we call it, uh, which is the opportunity for folks to learn about our policies and rules and the, um, the local waters here a little bit and opportunity for us to vet people and make sure that they're, um, I like to say, that they're you know, in control of the boat and they're adaptable, um, which usually you can tell about in the first five minutes of a checkout how it's going to go, and I'd say nine times out of ten. But uh, So the sailboats are the only ones where we actually go out in the water with um, the renter to be and make sure that they 
they've got the skills. We don't uh, we don't have outboards. We don't have motors on any of our boats that we rent. So it's really it's up to the skipper and the conditions, um, and obviously us maintaining the equipment at a safe level. Um, those factor. That's what's going to bring them back to the mooring or bring them back to the dock at the end of their sail. So. Sure. Aren't you worried about those kids, or do you care? Oh yeah, I yeah. am. <laughs> You're so laid back. Sounds good. Um, I'm Kestrel Bailey. I do operations, so a lot of like helping people through rentals and answering the phones and just kind of basic operations. And then I also do some of the kayak education. Uh, we do bioluminescence and sunset tours, and so I've started doing some of the um, the trip outings um, with another co-guide for that. And then I've also taught some of the Kayak 100 classes, which is kind of the basics of getting involved in kayaking and people having fun out on the water and having a good experience with kayaking. I really enjoy doing that. I love seeing people get excited about it. Um, I've grown up on the water. I grew up, grew up on the San Juan Islands, so grew up always playing with the water and getting out on boats. And, um, I think one thing that really attracted me to working here is just the really approachable aspect of getting people involved with the water and um, wanting to teach people how to enjoy it and to do that with confidence at whatever skill level they might start at. Um, so I've really enjoyed just everyone that I've worked with. Everyone is really chill and really easygoing and really loves what they do. And it's one of the first places I've worked where staff, volunteers, um, customers, everyone is just as important. And so they're looking at the personal health and well-being of everyone. And so there's always a good attitude and a fun time. And it's a great way to engage with the beautiful body of water that's around us. So yeah, it's been great. <laughs> and tell me your own favorite personal sport out on the water. Um, Personal favorite sport on the water. It's difficult because there's so many different aspects. Um, the one I'm most skilled at is kayaking. So I really enjoy that. I enjoy the being able to be really close to the water. Um, and so you can look around at the bottom, see the sea stars down there, and um, or the bioluminescence if you're out at night. Um, but I also love sailing. And I think for exercise, I really enjoy stand-up paddleboarding. So. Yeah, so everything is a lot of fun. <laughs> time taking the paddle boards out. Mine. Yours? And uh, how'd you do? Um, I did pretty good. It was really easy. <laughs> I was afraid to stand up, but it was pretty easy, yeah. Yeah, and how about you? This is my second time. And, uh, this one was harder. I, I don't know, this one and that one are different, but, but it was... And the, the water was taking us out instead of back in, so it was hard to get back. <laughs> and what do you like about paddle boarding as opposed to other kinds of water sports? Um, uh, for me, it's a lot easier to, um, with the kayak, it's like so big for me, I don't know, but like, this was, I don't know, it was just fun, and it was just fun trying to like stand up and stuff like that. It was, yeah, a lot more room to do stuff like that. What do you like? Um, it's more of a workout. Like you have to. It's a lot harder work getting places because you have to balance yourself and like get places. So I guess it's more fun and more challenging in that way. And how did you find out about the boating center? Um, my parents and I wanted to try like kayaking and other sports and stuff like that. And so we kind of looked around, and my dad likes watching the Alaska ferry leave, so we were down here and found it.
Center office. Um, we also have the gear shed here opposing it. And this is really the, the one stop shop for anything you might want to engage in at the boating center. If you want to volunteer, there you go. Head to the office if you want to rent a boat uh, from the livery or want to take a class. We don't have a lot of space, but we appreciate what we have. Um, and when we head over towards the gear shed, show that space a little bit. 
all these buildings were here when the nonprofit was formed. They were all part of the infrastructure of Fairhaven Boatworks, which um, predates the organization. But uh, I like to say if there's a surface here, it's been painted by a volunteer. Um, every, every single aspect of what constitutes the boating center currently um, has seen a lot of work and love and blood and sweat from everyone in the community, staff members, volunteers, to make it what it is today. Uh, it's come a long way and it will continue to go a long way, but this is really ground zero for anything. A, a class, um, a rental, um, we've got everything to equip all the boats stuffed into this um, quirky, charismatic old, old space. Um, I don't know how, how old the building actually is, but wetsuits for lessons or for rental, and kayak paddles, and other sundry equipment for rowboats and sailboats and all that good stuff, plenty of life jackets. And in the back, we have a small classroom, kind of multi-purpose space that the, the youth camps will store their gear in, or folks can change in, or a whiteboard to do a chalk talk for a sailing lesson. So um, not a lot of space, but it, it's pretty well-sized for what we do and the scale of our operation. Um, a lot of the equipment here has been, certainly has been donated. We purchased what we need to to make the programs run, but um, we receive a lot of donations um, or kind of bargain sales. Yeah. Maybe we can continue outside and take a look at a little bit of the equipment and boats we have. We have our sea kayak fleet, again available for rental and also used, um, used in classes. We have a uh, paddleboard fleet that has grown over the last year. Paddleboarding is pretty wildly popular, especially a sunny Saturday. Um, we have a sit on top kayak fleet in the back corner there. A sliding seat rowboat fleet, uh, rowing skulls, if you if you will, um, a standard kind of fixed seat uh, rowing fleet, which is actually quite popular. We have had a lot of volunteer work done in the past couple years uh, to build this fleet, and each boat is a little bit different. We can offer something different for for each renter. It looks like a family is about to take out the Dirty Dan Harris replica skiff that was built by Ralph Thacker and a community member a couple years ago and donated, uh, and. Uh, yeah, each boat kind of tells a story. Um, if you look beyond our rental equipment, most of the other boats in the yard, with a few exceptions, are uh, are privately owned by community, community members. They're dry moorage customers, but um, the large outrigger canoes here, those are owned by the Bellingham Bay Outrigger Club. Um, outrigger paddlers, Bebop is the name of the club. Um, so that's an example where the boating center kind of acts as a platform for another organization to you know do what it does. The boating center doesn't necessarily have to be all things to all people, but um, if a group galvanizes to around a certain activity, then maybe we can offer them competitive space or um, or something like that. There's also an informal sliding seat rowing club called New Whatcom Rowers um, that stores some boats here, and it's essentially like a rowing co-op um, tucked in here. You wouldn't know it necessarily, but those boats see a lot of use. Um, beyond the boats, we've got a workshop that sees a lot of... Uh, a lot of boat action in it. Anything that we might need to do work on that fits inside of it um, is, uh, is what we use that space for, and that's about it. There's not we don't have a big facility, but as you can see, we try to make the most of the square footage that we have. And we have a million dollar view. Can't argue that. Yeah, we can swap around after lunch too. I don't really want to swap. Is that a 
Well, you might yeah, have we'll, to. We'll see. You might have to okay, so now, actually, if you three want to carry this blue one, Dad,